Every summer, I have the distinct pleasure of spending an entire month with people from all over the world here in Dallas, teaching the Arabic language, Quranic Arabic, the language of the Quran, and discussing and exploring the timeless lessons and wisdoms of the Book of Allah. We call this experience Quran Intensive. Please check out BayinaSummer.com. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H Summer.com to get more information and sign up. I look forward to seeing you here, inshallah, at the Quran Intensive. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. ألم تعلم أن الله يعلم ما في السماء والأرض إن ذلك في كتاب إن ذلك على الله يسير ويعبدون من دون الله ما لم ينزل به سلطانا وما ليس لهم به عن وما للظالمين من نصير وإذا تتلى عليهم آياتنا بينات تعرف في وجوه الذين كفروا المنكر يكادون يسطون بالذين يتلون عليهم آياتنا قل أفأنبئكم بشر من ذلكم النار وعدها الله الذين كفروا وبئس المصير <clears throat> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa la aqibatu lil muttaqeen Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidil mursaleen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yumiddin So as is very obvious we are nearing the end of the surah And here at the end of the surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concluding a lot of the Topics and subjects that have been discussed throughout this entire surah And this is a salient feature of the Quran of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That whenever you have a surah, particularly the lengthier surahs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by stating the overarching theme or the thesis of the surah Throughout the surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala touches on different topics and subjects Thereby building the overall message that this surah is delivering And at the end of every single surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always concludes And he wraps up and he concludes what was talked about And this structure you can find in each and every single surah of the Quran And inshallah at, when we reach the end of the actual surah We'll talk about how the end of the surah ties back to the beginning of the surah And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfectly uh, ties together every everything that was talked about. But one thing that we can already start to take note of here and we can already start to observe is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wrapping up these issues and topics. <clears throat> First and foremost, even though, and this is very thought provoking and I want everyone to make sure they take a note of this and they remember this, that even though this is the surah in which fighting in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, basically um, responding to the aggressors with uh, aggression if, ne if uh, deemed necessary It was in this surah that that permission was given The first ayat of qital And the ayat that made qital permissible and legal Are in this very surah However at the end of the surah It is not by coincidence Because we know nothing in the Quran is coincidental It is not by coincidence that at the end of the surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends by telling the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَنْهُمْ مَنْ سَكَنْهُمْ نَاسِكُهُ فَلَا يُنَازِ في الأمر ودعوا إلى ربك. Don't pay attention to them. Everybody has their own way of going about things. They're doing what they got to do. So you make sure you, have, you do what you have to do. Don't engage with them. Because when you let somebody else distract you, when you, when you let somebody else pull you into a pointless, fruitless, frivolous argument, what, what ends up happening is that you become preoccupied. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not doing what you could be doing. And that's why Allah says, make sure you do your job. وَدْعُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكْ You keep calling to your Lord. إِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ هُدَمْ مُسْتَقِيمٌ Because that is the guided way. That is the path of guidance. To call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to sit and argue. 
That's not the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not the way, that's not the path of guidance, that's not Sirat al Mustaqim. But Sirat al Mustaqim is to call the people. And if you really take a look, just for a moment, if we were to kind of you know look at it and try to build some perspective, if you do a survey overall of people and you look at how people behave and what you come across, what you'll actually find is that it is always a very small minority of people that argue and debate and that are confrontational. The masses themselves are not engaging in this type of debate or argument, but they're rather waiting. The masses are thirsty, the masses are struggling, the masses are looking. But what happens is that the, the opposition is always loud. The opposition is always loud, and they're in your face. And the more that you engage with them, the more you're neglecting the people that deserve and are demanding your attention. And it's very, very important to remember that. This was a profound lesson from the usul of da'wah, and this is something that our teachers constantly told us. I remember asking kind of one of my, I remember asking not just one, actually, multiple teachers of mine when I was finishing my studies and coming back. <clears throat> you know, I was coming back to, there were certain dynamics in the community, and there was a lot of debate and argumentation and back and forth, and a lot of this, you know, uh, he said, she said type of stuff. And so I asked my teacher, I said, well, how do we handle this? How do we manage this? And I remember then he asked me, and I'm exclusively now talking within the Muslim community, but the same logic and the same statistics can actually be applied on a broader spectrum, even in the non-Muslim community. So he asked me, he said, okay, you're talking about people arguing back and forth and this ideology and this, me this methodology and this fiqh and that aqidah and back and forth. And so you're asking, how do you go about changing those minds and engaging with them and convincing them, et cetera, et cetera. And he asked me, he said, how many people are we talking about? So he asked me, how many people come for Salat al-Fajr? Back then it was probably about 50 people coming for Fajr. How many people come for Jumu'ah? There was probably about five, six, seven hundred people coming for Jumu'ah. Okay. He said, how many Muslims live in just that city, that area? And at that time, in that city, in that area, I kind of around, you know, I kind of guesstimated the number. I said probably about 5,000 Muslims live in that area. So he said, so let me get this straight. Even if we were to go off the Jumu'ah number, you're worried about this back and forth as is happening amongst 500 people. You have 4,500 people that are not engaged, that are not concerned with any of this, and you're completely forgetting about them. He said that, worry about them. Go engage with them. Go talk to them. Wadu'u ila rabbik. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika. Go and call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people who fight, they will always fight. There are some people that are just naturally inclined. And in fact, we should never say this about somebody specifically. We should never say this about someone specifically because we don't have the right to do so. Wallahu alimun bidhati sudur. Allah knows what's within the hearts. But what we can say generally from the Quran, from the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, one of the things that we understand and we extrapolate from there, and generally we can say this, is that there will always be a segment. There will always be a group. There will always be some people. It's almost as if they were just created to be a fitna for everyone else. They were created to make trouble. That's their designation from Allah. And so again, we don't say that about anyone specifically, and God forbid should we think of someone like that. And if we start thinking about someone in that manner, we're probably closer to that reality than those people are. But the fact of the matter is, we still have to come to terms. Is there a need to engage and talk to everyone? Yes. But the question begs, are you doing it at the expense of others? That's the question. So when we talk, with, when we talk outside, when we talk about the general you know, American society, there are those people in the media, there are those certain organizations, there's that small minority that does nothing but hate mongering. And that constantly is co coming at us, bickering with us, arguing with us, debating us, you know, slandering us, all these different types of things. They, we, we do need to engage them and talk to them at some level, but not at the expense of the 99%. Not at the expense of them. And so this is the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the Prophet sallallahu here, is that you will have the Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, and the Abu Jahal, and the Abu Lahab, and the Umayyah bin Khalaf. There will be these people. And talk to them whenever the opportunity presents itself, no doubt. 
but make sure that you don't let them occupy you because that's actually a part of their strategy. To busy you so much with the back and forth that you're no longer addressing the masses. It's, I mean, we have to think about our da'wah as well. Do we spend more time answering criticisms or actually delivering a message? Are we more reactionary or are we more proactive? We have to think about this. We're constantly like answering misconceptions. But what happened to just presenting Allah to the people? Talking to people about Allah. That's what the Prophet ﷺ did. And he answered questions when they were presented to him, but the majority of his time was occupied by talking about Allah. And so that's what Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, it's basically continuing on. So the reason why I kind of started back there, because this continue on, continues on from there. Ayah number 70 is a continuation. So Allah said that Allah uh, in ayah number 68, that if they do argue and fight with you, then say Allah knows best what you are doing. And in ayah number 68, 69, Allah will decide amongst all of you on the day of resurrection about what you argue and differ and, and, and disagree about. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 70, and see even the, even the, the way that Allah addresses this, it, it teaches us a lesson. Immediately what does Allah say? أَلَمْ تَعَلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ Haven't you realized? Ilm. The word ilm is used. Haven't you realized? Haven't you understood? Don't you understand? Don't you realize? Don't you know? <laughs> and this type of su'al, of course, is like a rhetorical question. And yes, it's addressing the Prophet ﷺ, but through the Prophet ﷺ, it's addressing all of humanity. And this instruction is being given to the Prophet ﷺ, like you say this to them. Don't you realize, don't you understand that Allah knows all that which is in the sky and all that which is in the earth. And what's very interesting is normally when we see this construction, مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Normally we see the word samawat, the plural is used. And that talks about all the heavens, the seven heavens. But here it's saying مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ that means the sky, sama'ud dunya. When the singular sama is used, that means sama'ud dunya. So Allah is saying that don't you understand and realize that Allah knows all that which is in the sky and all that which is in the earth. Meaning it's talking about the human realm, the area of the human beings. So because Allah said Allah knows everything that you're doing and He will decide amongst you. And he will make the final decision. So now Allah is saying that Allah knows everything in the sky and in the earth. So where are you gonna go? Like Allah says in Surah Al-Rahman, that go outside of the, of the area, the jurisdiction of Allah. Nowhere will you go except that Allah's jurisdiction is there, and Allah's kingdom is there, and Allah's control is there. So similarly, it's saying Allah knows everything in the heavens and the earth, in the sky and in the earth, so no matter what you're doing, where you're doing it, Allah knows it, and Allah is keeping tabs on it. مَا يَكُونُ مِن نَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ Whenever three people get together, the word najwa, munajat, means that somebody f at night, in the Arabic language it means at night, somebody goes into a private place and then whispers and talks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when three people in the middle of the night go into a corner and whisper and talk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rabi'uhum, Allah is a fourth one, a part of that conversation. When five people do that, the sixth one is Allah. There can be more, there can be less, but no matter how many there are and where they are and when they are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there with them. So Allah is a witness to all of this. Allah says we created the human being and we know what his soul whispers to him. Meaning that even before you realize that you're thinking about something, Allah already knows that you're thinking about it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he knows everything in the sky and in the earth. أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ فِي كِتَابِ now this has multiple meanings. Again, this is the kalam of Allah and it has multiple meanings. It means most definitely that. Meaning Allah's knowledge, fi kitabin. It is in a book. Now, at the same time, in the Arabic language, kitab also means maktub, that which is written. 
So on one hand, it means all the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in written form. And we have a hadith that tell us this. There's a hadith in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, narrated by Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدَّرَ مَقَادِيرَ الْخَلَائِقِ قَبْلَ خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بِخَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala predestined the destiny of all the creation before the creating of the heavens and the earth by 50,000 years. 50,000 years before Allah created this entire cone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already written down what would transpire with all the creation of Allah. وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى الْمَا And his arsh at that time was on top of the water. In another hadith that is narrated by a jama'atun min al-sahaba, the, a whole group of sahaba narrate this particular hadith, and it is found in dozens of books of a hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ said, awwal ma khalaq Allahu al-qalam. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was the pen. Qala lahu uktub. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the pen, write. Qala wa ma aktub. The pen asked, what should I write? قَالَ أُكْتُبْ مَا هُوَ كَائِنٌ Write what will happen. فَجَرَ الْقَلَمُ بِمَا هُوَ كَائِنٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And then the pen started writing and, uh, and, and kept on writing everything that would transpire until the day of resurrection. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ refers to when he says, رُفِعَتِ الْأَقْلَامُ وَجَفَّتِ السُّحُفِ The pens have lifted, the pages have dried. So everything, all the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually in written form. And that is a part of our aqidah, a part of our belief. The Qur'an and the sunnah talks about this. So that's one general meaning of it. And it's to give confidence. It's to give confidence that not only does Allah know, but Allah put it into written form. Like that's what we believe in. But there is another meaning to this as well that fits into the context. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, inna dhalika fi kitab. Most definitely that. Now that could also not only be referring to what Allah, Allah's knowledge but it could also be referring to ma ta'amalun, what you all are doing. So everything that all of you are doing is in the book. It's in a book. What book is it talking about? The book of deeds. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, kiraman katibina ya'lamuna ma ta'falun. You have the noble scribes, the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are writing down everything that the people do. When a person will be brought on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the angels, put his book in front of him. First we know the Qur'an says that the book will be handed to the person and that will be a sign of their success or failure. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ هَاؤُمْ اِقْرَأُوا كِتَابِيَا He'll say, look, look, read my book. And then there will be those people that will be handed their book of deeds in the left hand. فَيَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أُوتَ كِتَابِيَا I wish I was never given my book. So there will be people that will be given their book in their right hand and people that will be given their book in their left hand. Alright? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once that book is given to that person, Allah will command that person, اِقْرَأْ كِتَابَكْ Read your book. كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا This will suffice for your accounting today. You tell me what I should do with you. فَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ You'll see the criminals, they'll be very afraid of what's in that book. يَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا They'll curse themselves. مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ What's wrong with this book? لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَ وَلَا كَبِيرَ إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا It does not leave something small or something big, except that it encompasses everything. وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا They will find everything that they have done present in that book. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Your Lord does not wrong anyone in the least bit. So that's the book that it's talking about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ And each and every single thing, Allah says, we are compiling it. أَحْصَيْنَاهُ We have compiled it. في إمام مبين In a very clear book. And Allah calls the book Imam. Because in another place in the Quran, Allah says, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On that day, each and every single group of people will be called by their Imam. Not only just by their leader, but each and every single soul will follow their book. Meaning their deeds will lead them either to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to the wrath and the anger of Allah. And so this is that book that it's talking about. Inna dhalika fi kitab. Don't you worry. Now Allah is telling the believers, everything is in the book. 
Your suffering, your persecution, the torture that you've been put through, your patience, your diligence, your devotion, your dedication, your commitments, everything is in the book. Your faith is written down in the book that you were faithful. When the difficult, most difficult of circumstances came, you remained faithful. That's in the book. But on the flip side, it's telling the others that everything is in the book. Your disbelief, your shirk, your kufr, your hatred, your violence, your animosity, your enmity, your sinfulness, your wretchedness, everything is written in the book. Your dhulm, your oppression of these people is written in the book. Inna dhalika fi kitab. And then Allah says something truly profound. Inna dhalika ala Allahi yaseer. And this is why the mufassirun say that this is the meaning within the context of the ayat. Let me first tell you what it literally means. Inna dhalika most definitely that ala Allahi upon Allah yaseerun. It is very simple, very easy. Yaseer means something very little. So when you're talking about the quantity of something, you would say shay'un yaseerun, it's just a little bit. Like if you had a little bit of food, ta'amun yaseer, you just had a little bit of food. But similarly, when something is also very easy, it's also called yaseer. Not very difficult, very little, very easy to manage. Not much at all. And so it's saying, إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ That most definitely that upon Allah is very easy. Meaning it is very, very easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What, so now what does it mean that is very easy for Allah? Writing down everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows? Because we know the knowledge of Allah is limited, so how could it be written down? إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Which is basically Allah's way of saying, you worry about you. Don't worry about it. Right? And there have been groups in our, uh, in our history who did worry about it a little too much. And you know what ended up happening? They ended up outside the fold of Islam. They ended up doing a number on themselves. So, inna dhalika ala Allahi yaseer. Don't worry about Allah. You don't worry about Allah. You worry about yourself. The second meaning of inna dhalika ala Allahi yaseer in this context is that if what every single person does, good or bad, is written down and recorded, I mean... How does that even work? How many people have there been? If there's almost 2 billion people in the world today, then how many people have there been throughout time? And then all their deeds written down? How does that even work? You think that's difficult for Allah? This is very easy. And that's why in the construction of the ayah, I point this out every single time we come across it, because it's in the Qur'an and we have to make note of it. Normal grammatical structure would dictate that the sentence, that a sentence would be structured, إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ يَسِيرٌ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ يَسِيرٌ عَلَى اللَّهِ But that's not what Allah said. Allah said, إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ this is called at-taqdeem wa ta'akhir. This is abnormal sentence structure. And when you create abnormal sentence structure, the primary benefit of it is exclusivity, ikhtisas. So now the meaning of only is added into it. That most definitely that is very easy only for Allah. I mean, you can't even comprehend it. But it's super simple and easy for Allah. How simple and easy for Allah? Allah told us in the Quran, kun. فَيَكُنْ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا When Allah wants something to be, كُنْ فَيَكُنْ He says, be and it is. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turning His attention to these wretched people. Allah says, وَيَعْبُدُونَ Ayah number 71, وَيَعْبُدُونَ And they continue to worship. مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Asides from Allah. مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا Alright, I want you to appreciate now the structure. Especially some, most of y'all should be able to comprehend a lot of this. مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا That which he has not sent down in regards to it any proof. Sultan is a word which basically means authority. But it's used synonymous with proof. It's used in the meaning of proof sometimes. But what type of proof? It means very, very authoritative, conclusive, absolute proof. Proof after which the conversation is over. Proof after which the conversation is over. There is no conversation after this proof. So, وَيَعْبُدُونَ They continue. 
In spite of all of this, they continue to worship other than Allah, aside from Allah. That which Allah did not reveal, that which Allah did not send down in regards to it, any type, sultanan, it's in the common form, any type of absolute authoritative or conclusive proof. وَمَا And that which لَيْسَ لَهُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٌ And that which they do not have any knowledge in regards to. مَا لَيْسَ لَهُمْ they do not have bihi in regards to it ilmun. So what, what Allah is saying here is wayabuduna, they continue to worship other than Allah. Wayabuduna min dunillah. They worship other than Allah. We know that much. What do they worship other than Allah? Ma. This ma mausula, basically the sila in the mausul is functioning as the maf'ul here. It is the object. This is the object. Malam Yunazil bi Sultan is the object. Aside from Allah, they are worshipping that which Allah did not send down any proof, any authoritative absolute proof in regards to. Meaning what they worship other than Allah, there is nothing, there is not there is no dala'il naqaliya. There is no text, there is no revelation, there is no type of religious proof that tells them to worship this. Then there is a second object of the same action. And they worship other than Allah. مَا لَيْسَ لَهُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٌ That which they don't have any understanding of. Meaning now, دَلَائِلَ aqliya. They don't even have any rational proof as to why they worship what they worship. So they don't have any divine scripture or divine text that tells them to worship these idols. They don't even have any type of logical proof as to why they worship these idols. I don't want to jump the gun over here. I don't want to go too ahead in explaining the illogical nature of shirk. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the next ayah, in the next session that we're going to study, ayah number 73, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the illogical nature of shirk. And I'll talk about it more so there. And of course, whose, whose explanation will be better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself? But nevertheless, what you can understand over here here is Allah is saying, they worship other than Allah, something that they don't have any scripture that tells them to worship it, nor do they have any type of logical proof or evidence, anything intellectual that would tell them to worship this thing. And there is no, so now one of the things that we've seen here, and I just want to explain this for anybody who might not be familiar with Arabic grammar, and even our students here for Quran Intensive, this is something we're going to be learning this week, inshallah, is that there are multiple types of ma. We've seen two ma's that come before, ma lam yunazil bi sultanan, ma laysa lahum bihi ilmun, these are called ma mausula. It basically uh, is the object of what they're worshipping. It means that which. But now, the ma that's used here at the end of the ayah, ma lidhalimina, this is the ma nafia. This is the ma of negation. And it doesn't just simply mean no. It does not just simply negate. On top of that, what it does, on top of that, what it does is that it is refutation. It is the ma of refutation. So it is negation, but on top of that, it's refutation. What does refutation mean in case that's too big of a word for somebody? What does refutation mean? It, negation would mean no. Just negating something. It is not. All right? Refutation means contrary to what you might think. Contrary to what you assume. Contrary to what you thought. So it's basically negating a false notion or a concept that they had. They assumed something in Allah is saying, it is not as you thought it was. It is not like you assumed it is. Rather, the con to the contrary, مَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ نصير. Al-Zalimin means those who did wrong. And of course, we've talked about the meaning of zulm. Zalam, darkness comes from this word. Shirk is referred to as zulm. Sinning is referred to as zulm. Oppression is zulm. Basically, it means wadu or shayfi ghayri mahallihi to misappropriate something, to put something where it does not belong. So all these people that engage in this, this type of evil behavior, min nasirin, they will not have any the min here is for further emphasis. They will not have any. They will not have a single helper, nasib. They will have absolutely no one to help them. 
They will have absolutely no one to aid them, no one to help them. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say this? You would kind of assume that that's understood. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, first and foremost, Allah is concluding, really just sealing the deal. Saying that not only have you worshipped, have you put your faith in something that does not make any sense, nor was there any instruction to worship it. But on top of that, you've worked yourself into such a corner now where you have no options. You got no outs. If you stick with this, Ya'buduna, if you stick with this and keep going with this, guess what? You're going to end up in a position, end up in a ditch that there is no way out of. You've worked yourself into that corner. The second reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is because specifically at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the nature of the shirk of the people in Mecca was مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى they said, we don't worship these idols except to bring us closer to Allah. So they believed in Allah, they just believed in these idols as being intercessors or connectors to Allah. And so they said, we will win the favor of Allah by worshipping all these little godlings. They'll bring us closer to the God. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you have nobody to help you. You have nobody in your corner. First of all, these shuraka, these things that you worship other than Allah, they have no reality. They have no reality. They are the creation of Allah. Number two, in fact, to further prove the point, there are ayat in the Quran that tell us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring those things that they used to worship in this dunya. Allah will bring those things forward on the day of judgment and hold them accountable. And they will turn against the people that used to worship them and say, we have absolutely nothing to do with these people. We never told these people to worship us. We take no responsibility for these people. We worry about ourselves. And so they'll be completely abandoned. They'll be left out to dry by the same things that they put their faith in that they worshipped other than Allah. مَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِن نَصِيرٍ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us something to be very careful about. You know when you're wrong and somebody points out to you that you're wrong, how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? It tells you a lot about yourself. It tells you, it's a litmus test. It tells you a lot about yourself. When you're wrong and then you're told you're wrong, it's pointed out to you that you are wrong. How do you handle it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the quality of these people. وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ وَإِذَا تُتْلَى This is the passive form. That when it is recited upon them, when our ayat, آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ our signs are very clearly, very lucidly, very clearly, very explicitly recited upon them. When our signs are very clearly laid out for them. And the reason why it says it in the passive is Allah is saying it doesn't matter who does it. Whether it is Allah doing it in the Quran, whether it is the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam doing it, whether it is the Sahaba doing it, whether it is the believers doing it, whenever the ayats of Allah, whenever the signs of Allah are laid out very clearly upon these people, ta'rifu, you will recognize. Ta'rifu, you will recognize fi wujuhi alladheena kafaru in the faces of those people who have disbelieved al munka. Al-Munkar in the Arabic language comes from Inkar. It is the ism of Fa'ul of Inkar. Right, everybody? Ankara yunkiru inkaran fahuwa munkirun wa unkir. No? Okay, mashallah. Uh, all right, I'll take a look at the test, inshallah, tonight. So, Al-Munkar. Munkar is the ism of Fa'ul, right? And so, Inkar means to disapprove of something. To disapprove of something. Munkar is that which is disapproving or that which is uh, that which you disapprove of, that which is distasteful. It is um, it is distasteful, it is wretched, it is something that is uh, repulsive. Something that is repulsive, something that is distasteful and repulsive. And so ta'rifu fi wujuhi alladheena kafaru al-munkar. Ta'rifu al-munkar fi wujuhi alladheena kafaru. Again. Normal grammatical structure would dictate it would be ta'rifu al munkara fi wujuhi alladheena kafaru. But that's not what Allah said. Allah said ta'rifu fi wujuhi alladheena kafaru al munkara. Which means that you will see only in the faces of those people who disbelieve, you will see in their faces repulsion and disapproval. The, they, they, they seem like they've just seen something really disgusting. Like they've just witnessed something disgusting. It is so distasteful to them. You know, again, 
It is from the ethics of discussion with the believers. Believers are dignified people. Allah shows them respect. The Prophet of Allah taught us to respect them. So we should, it is, it, is, it is from the ethics of dealing with believers that you should not liken believers to disbelievers. You should not do that. Shouldn't do that. It's, it's inappropriate. All right? And a lot of times it's used as almost a form of spiritual blackmail. And we, we, we talk to believers as if we're talking to disbelievers. We equate their sins to shirk and kufr. And this is against the fundamental point of our, our aqidah. This goes against our aqidah. We don't treat believers that way. However, the reason why I'm giving this disclaimer is Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he says the ayat that are clearly, explicitly addressing the disbelievers, even in those ayat, there is an ibra and a lesson, a reflection, a reminder for the believers. There is a lesson. So I'd like to communicate that lesson, but I wanted to give that disclaimer so that nobody would understand that this is actually like, this, this equals disbelief. Because that would be wrong and that would be incorrect. But there is a reflection here. So Allah is telling the Prophet Allah is telling all of us in the Quran that when the ayat are clearly laid out upon these people, for the sake of these people, you will recognize, you will recognize specifically in the faces of those people who disbelieved, you'll recognize disapproval and disgust and repulsion. So first and foremost, Allah switches the order, the abnormal sentence structure to say that if the ayat are being recited, the believers will never disapprove. The believers will never be repulsed. The believers will embrace. They'll be enthralled. They'll be enlightened. Right? It'll raise them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this at the end of Surah Tawbah. وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ أَيُّكُمْ زَادَتْهُ هَذِي إِيمَانًا فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَهُمْ يَسَّبْشِرُونَ When the ayat, when the surah, when the ayat come down, when they are recited to the people, the people who believe, زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا It increases them in iman, وَهُمْ يَسَّبْشِرُونَ And they are excited, they are enlightened. Right? We talked about وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts shake and tremble at the mention of the name of Allah. They are enlightened. When the ayat are recited to them, it is the disbelievers that are disgusted and who disapprove and are repulsed by the mention of the ayat of Allah. So it is only those disbelievers. But going to Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah's fa- uh, uh, point, what we need to think about is when the name of Allah is mentioned in our presence, when the Qur'an is recited, when, uh, when something from the guidance of Allah and His Messenger وسلم, is presented to us, what is our reaction to it? Are we bothered? Are we disturbed? Are we agitated? Are we enlightened? Do we approve? Do we engage? Do we take it in? We, nobody should judge anyone else. Each and every single person should think for themselves. And if I do find it cumbersome and bothersome, and it does kind of agitate and irritate me a little bit sometimes, while that might not be, I, can, I, I, I don't have to, you know, be fearful that I'm now a kafir. But one thing that it does tell me is that I am starting to exhibit some of the symptoms of kufr. I'm starting to exhibit some of the symptoms of kufr. I'm in the periphery. I'm near enough to start to kind of feel the heat. And so what, what, the, what the intelligent person would do is let me take a couple of steps back right now. Let me reverse this course very, very quickly. So, وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ تَعَرِفُ فِي وُجُوهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الْمُنْكَرُ Allah says, يَكَادُونَ how strong is their hate and their disbelief? Yakaduna, they are very close. Yastuna, that they would attack. Sata, sata yastu, yastuna, it means to lunge, to attack, to pounce. They are very close to attacking. Billadina yatluna alayhim ayatina. They are very close to attacking those people who are reciting our ayat upon them. Who recite our ayat to them. They're very close to attacking them. 
And this again is very relevant at that time of the Prophet ﷺ where the believers were attacked. And even in our times, it starts to become very prudent and pertinent. You know, constantly we hear about people due to just even living. You know, reciting the signs means manifesting the ayat and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which can also allude to and refer to living by the Islamic code. We recently heard the news of a sister dressed modestly, dressed like a Muslim does. And she's walking, and for no other reason than out of hatred and spite towards her, somebody murdered her, stabbed her to death. And so, يَكَادُونَ يَسْتُونَ بِالَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِنَا Allah is providing consolation to the believers here. What does Allah say? قُلْ So in response, what do you say to them? أَفَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِشَرِّمْ مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ أَفَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِشَرِّمْ مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ Should I tell you? Should I inform you? Should I make you aware? تَنْبِي Right? أُنَبِّئُكُمْ From نَبَأَ Should I make you aware? of something truly profound. بِشَرِّمْ مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ About something even worse than that which bothers you people? Like the ayat of Allah or what troubles you and bothers you? Should I tell you about something even worse than that? Meaning something that should bother you? A lot more than how much the ayat of Allah bother you? How much seeing Muslims bothers you? How much seeing the practice of the deen and the religious practice bothers you? Should I tell you about something that should bother you a lot more than that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, An-nar, An-nar, the fire of hell. That should bother you a lot more. That should trouble you a lot more. That's what you should be busying and preoccupying yourself with. How to get out of that? an And the Mufassirun mentioned, pretty much all of them, Ibn Kathir, Al-Qurtubi, Zamakhshari, all the Mufassirun mentioned that there are three recitations of the word An-nar. an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding by saying, ذَلِكَ annar. It is the fire. The fire of hell. Annara, Which means that Allah provides the explanation that what should be bothering you more, let me explain to you, it is the fire. Annari, And that would be the badal of what was stated previously. أَفَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِشَرِّمْ مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ annari. That what should be bothering you a lot more is the fire. So either way, it leads to the same, but you see the versatility and the flexibility and the power of Allah's kalam. An-naru. An-nar, the fire of hell. Wa'adaha Allahu alladhina kafaru. Allah has promised it to those who disbelieved. Allah has promised it to those people who disbelieved. Think about how strong of a statement is it. For Allah to say, Allah has guaranteed it. Allah has promised it to those who disbelieve. May Allah protect us all. And then Allah says, وَبِئِسَ الْمَصِيرِ And that is the worst place anyone could end up. In Surah Al-Mu'minun, in Surah number 23, Ayah number 117, the next surah, at the end of the next surah, and this again shows you the consistency of the Qur'an, at the end of the next surah, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرِ Anyone, anyone who calls out to uh, who calls out to another God along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la burhana lahu bihi. That person has absolutely no proof and no evidence for this preposterous, ridiculous statement. فَإِنَّمَا حِسَابُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ And his reckoning and his accounting will be with his Lord and Master. إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Such wretched people will never attain success. Uh, and finally here, one of the things I wanted to mention about the balagha of this ayah, and just a little point about Quranic eloquence that's very interesting is that in a similar statement in another place, which is found in Surah Al Ma'idah, ayah number 60, Allah says, Qul hal unabbi'ukum bi sharrim min dhalika. Qul hal unabbi'ukum bi sharrim min dhalika. Say, should I not tell you about something worse than that? Here Allah says, قُلْ أَفَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِشَرِّمْ مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ Over there He says, مِنْ ذَلِكَ Here He says, مِنْ ذَلِكُمْ In a very, pretty much the same structure. Over there He says, ذَلِكَ Over here He says, ذَلِكُمْ Why? 
Why does he say both ways? Well, the basic meaning is that they both mean basically the same thing. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Of course, we know that's not how it works in the kalam of Allah. Everything is specific and precise. Why did Allah say dhalika there? Why did he say dhalikum here? Well, there's a rule in the Arabic language. When you increase the construction of the word, you increase the meaning of the word. Dhalika is those three letters you see there. Dhalika. Over here, Allah says dhalikum. Did the word get bigger? That means the meaning got bigger. You want to know something very interesting? In, uh, in the ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah, when Allah says, مِنْ ذَلِكَ What group is He talking to? مَثُوبَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ The reward that they will find from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَنْ They are those people, لَعَنَهُ اللَّهُ That Allah has cursed them. وَغَضِبَ عَلَيْهِ And He is angry with them. وَجَعَلَ مِنْهُمْ الْقِرَدَةَ وَالْخَنَازِيرَ وَعَبْدَ الطَّاغُوتِ And Allah turned them into monkeys and swine. He turned them into monkeys and pigs. Here Allah says, "Anar wa'adaha Allahu al-ladina kafaru bi shari min dalikum. Anar wa'adaha Allahu al-ladina kafaru." So over there Allah says, "Dalika," but He's speaking about the people, the specific group of people at a particular point, time, and place in history that Allah subhanahu wa taala turned into monkeys and pigs. Here Allah is talking about. Anyone and everyone who disbelieves. Which group is bigger? The people that Allah turned into p pigs and monkeys or the people that disbelieve? Which group and quantity is bigger? The people who disbelieve. Therefore Allah uses the bigger word for them. He uses the word dhalikum for them. And He used the word dhalika for the smaller group of people. He used the word dhalikum for the larger group of people. How precise and how specific is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalam? All right, so we end here, we conclude here, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ That is the worst place anyone could end up. And in the next ayah, in the next session, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be talking about the, the fallacy of, uh, of shirk and associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Um, you know, when uh, over the course of a month, obviously, it's... Um, we have a lot of people and everybody gets very close and uh, you know, being away for, for this much time, a lot of times there's different circumstances and dis different situations that come across and come upon people and their loved ones and their family members. So a couple of announcements I just wanted to make in regards to requesting dua. The first announcement that I had was uh, one of our students, mashallah, somebody who did Quran intensive in 2011. Uh, she graduated from the Dream Program two years ago and she completed the Qalam Seminary just uh, earlier uh, this month. Sister Jenna, who's been TAing here as well during the month, uh, she fell very ill and she had a little uh, surgery as well. But alhamdulillah, she's much, much better now. She's recovering now. Please make dua for her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easier for her. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means of elevating her status in this life and in the next. And secondly, one of our uh, students here at Quran Intensive, Brother Adil, his uncle was admitted to the hospital yesterday and also underwent a surgery. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him a complete and quick recovery. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.